This is a pretty interesting and timely session today, all about cybersecurity insurance. So if you are like most of the people that we speak to here at Defendify, you probably are, you know, you've had a renewal or you're looking for cyber insurance or you just have some questions that might need to be uh, answered or just looking to learn a little bit more about what this cyber insurance thing is. If you've turned on the TV or you are read the news on your phone or wherever you're getting it from nowadays, you've probably seen some headlines about breaches. So we are here to talk about, you know, the perfect storm for cyber insurance. We're going to go ahead and uh, get started. A couple housekeeping items here. Um, first of all, I am Shanna Utgard. I am the Senior Cybersecurity Advocate here at Defendify, your all-in-one cybersecurity solution. We're based up here in Portland, Maine, so winter is uh, upon us <laughs> up in this neck of the woods. Um, I'm going to be the moderator today having a panel discussion. Um, looks like we got a full house today so we're going to kick everything off um, again i'm shanna like banana from defendify and we'll get started with our two panelists today so today i'm joined by david fins of alliant insurance um, david do you want to take a, a second and tell everybody about yourself and your background sure so i i am an attorney by training but for the past 16 years uh, i've been working in the insurance industry almost entirely during that time um, as a broker, and a broker represents the interests of the policyholder, or as we call them, the insured, uh, in the transaction. So we're, we are the buyer's representative, if you will. We're not like your state farm agent, right? We're not representing the interests of the insurance company. We go out to market, we try to get you the best coverage that we can, and when you have a claim, we help you navigate through the claims process. Um, so, you know, that in a nutshell is what I do. Awesome. And our other panelist for today is Sid Bose. Sid, why don't you introduce yourself to everybody and tell us a little bit about your background. Thank you very much for having me first off. So hi, everybody. My name is Sid Bose. I'm an attorney with Ice Miller. I work in our data security and privacy group. Um, my practice focuses on anywhere with respect to IT and legal. Um, in my prior life, uh, this is going back a couple of years, I spent almost 10 years in IT work in various roles. And so as I came over to the other dark side and decided to become an attorney. So here I am. I, uh, I did kind of the opposite switch in one of my past lives. I was a real estate paralegal. So doing a lot of closings up here in Maine and I wired $2.1 million to a cyber attacker. So that is how I got my start in cybersecurity, you know, kind of cut my teeth, if you will. And that opened a new door for me to help people never feel that feeling when like everything up here drops through the floor. Uh, <laughs> and you kind of have that oh-ish moment because like a lot of people, I never thought that a you know large cybersecurity incident would happen to me. And there was a, a pretty um, extreme case of business email compromise and $2.1 million out the door. Thankfully, we were able to recover it thanks to our little main bank. But but uh, I kind of took the opposite role from, you know, legal into IT. So um, thank you both for joining us today. We've got a ton of questions. We actually had a couple people that submitted some questions beforehand. So we'll make sure that we get into all of that. Now, let me see my slides advance in here. Our marketing guy is so good. So um, if you have any questions that you would like us to answer, feel free to put those down into the Q&A section. We've got a, a few questions that were sent in ahead of time and a few topics that we wanted to cover today, uh, but go ahead and drop those questions in. So, um, David, I'm going to start with you on this one. Can you tell us what exactly cybersecurity insurance is? Sure. So cyber insurance is sort of a catch-all term that is used to describe an insurance product that is meant to cover the damage that an organization suffers, both to themselves and defending and settling claims brought by other people, because there has been some damage caused to the network or the data that is handled by that organization. Now that damage could result from an attack on the outside. It sometimes results from human error, but either way, there are costs involved, both what we call first party, right, which is the response to the incident, what an organization must do to deal with the after effect of it. And then the third party costs, which could be brought by plaintiffs or by regulators alleging some sort of claim that they suffered a harm as a result of this incident. 
So uh, how is this different? We talk to some people here at Defendify and we ask if they have cybersecurity insurance. And a lot of the times we're met with responses like I have, um, you know, a, a rider or um, you know some additional coverage on my general liability policy or um, I think that's covered in my my E and O, my errors and emissions policy. How is a, a standalone cybersecurity insurance policy different than like a rider on liability or uh, you know? Well and, and other insurance products may nibble on the fringes of this exposure, right? They may pick up bits and pieces of an event. So for example, a fraudulent transfer of funds, something like what you described before, might be picked up under an organization's crime policy. Or if you're a law firm and a client alleges that you breached attorney-client privilege by allowing their personal information to be disclosed, yes, their malpractice coverage, their, their E&O might respond to that. But these other products were not written with the, with the digital world in mind. Right. They, they really do not pick up the broad range of the types of losses that an organization sustains when they suffer an attack. And they don't necessarily have ready access to the service providers that can help a business deal with a breach or an outage to their network or a ransomware event. Whereas a cyber insurance uh, policy will typically connect the policyholder with service providers that can help them get through that difficult time. Awesome. Um, and what are some examples, and this, this can go to either of you, I know we have a, a question here, Sid, it looks like you were typing an answer for one of our attendees, and I think we probably are going to cover that one there, but uh, speaking of coverage, what types of claims does a cybersecurity insurance typically cover? Cyber insurance can cover a variety of different things. When you look at um, computer forensics, um, privacy or security breach notifications, crisis management, um, data loss or destruction, payment of ransomware. So it can really cover a wide gamut of things. And really, it, it does become very policy sensitive. Um, but ideally, you think of cyber insurance as particularly catered around incidents or, or losses or damages that would arise from things like hacking, business email compromise, theft of hardware, um, you know, things of that nature. So you can really span a wide array of, of damages and costs associated with these types of incidents and have those covered with a cyber insurance policy. Awesome. I know a, a lot of people have been, for the first time, starting to look at gaining cybersecurity insurance coverage, or for a lot of people, their policies have been renewing lately. And one of the themes that I'm seeing a lot out in the marketplace is insurers have stopped providing cybersecurity insurance coverage. Um, you know, premiums have increased, uh, coverage amounts have decreased, and a lot. There's a lot of you know just stir out there uh, in the the IT sector talking about what's changed over the last, let's say two years or even the last year specifically, uh, what are some of the factors that you've seen contribute to this market shift? I mean, the number one contributing factor has been the ransomware epidemic, for lack of a better word. Um, the, the fact of the matter is that underwriters have gotten a lot more astute about connecting the dots and determining what types of security controls a business ought to have to minimize their exposure to these sorts of attacks and also to manage the event, to manage the incident response when it does occur, to try to minimize the losses. Um, that has come out of this spate of ransomware events that we've seen in the news over the past 12, 18 months. Not that ransomware is a recent development, but it's sort of taken on a life of its own over the past year, year and a half. Um, so. Although I'm a broker and I represent the interests of companies looking for insurance, I recognize that this adjusting of the pricing, the increases of what we call retentions, which function much like a policy deductible would on your homeowners or auto, it's the amount of risk that you retain. Uh, these adjustments along with the more stringent underwriting uh, criteria, the questions that they are asking during the renewal process is ultimately what is going to be necessary for the product 
to continue to be offered to businesses profitably. Because if underwriters can't make a profit writing the coverage, they're not going to continue to do so. And so, you know, I've been referring to this as the growing pains in cyber insurance. There was actually a very good piece that came out today from the cyber product leader at Swiss Re, one of the leading reinsurers that called it cyber uh, is, is now going through puberty. So much along the same lines of the growing pains. I don't believe this is the end of the cyber insurance market. I think it's the maturing of it and a recognition that underwriters are going to need to look under the hood and have a better understanding of what an organization is doing to manage cyber risk so that they can continue to write the coverage. So it's not just how many employees do you have, how many locations how do many you have, records. what's your animal revenue or yeah. your annual revenue. Yeah, uh, we've seen a, a lot of requests from Defendify customers who have gotten a 17 tab Excel spreadsheet that's asking about all of these different things that, that they have in, in place. Um, what's uh, really been interesting to me to watch over the last year was especially is the change in ransomware. And this is something that we've talked about a lot over here at Defendify. Um, one of the most fascinating things for me is the double extortion side of things. And this kind of changed the game for a lot of organizations going out and soliciting cybersecurity insurance policies, because in the past it was just, I've encrypted your files, you need to pay me X amount of money in cryptocurrency and I'll give you the key to unlock them and you can have everything back. Uh, but our, our amazing IT teams were so great. We had you know comprehensive backups that were tested. And if we suffered a ransomware incident, it was, well, you know, that's cute. We're just gonna wipe and restore this device and carry on with our day. Obviously cyber attackers didn't like that very much. So now they're lurking. They're exfiltrating data. They're taking a copy of your sensitive information, your IP, you know, confidential um, files. They're looking for cybersecurity insurance coverage documents. So they're looking for, you know, how much coverage you have. That way, they know exactly how much to extort you for, so that it makes more sense, you know, for for a lot of organizations to get back up and running. Just pay the ransom, um, you know, move on with the day. It makes more sense for the insurance company to pay that. So they'll find, you know, that delicate balance there. And then there's the double extortion side of things with, I've taken a copy of your data. And if you don't pay me my cryptocurrency, then I'm going to release your information on the dark web, which I think has really thrown a, a wrench in a lot of things. Um, some other things that we've seen a lot in, in this, um, pandemic is supply chain attacks, um, you know, solar winds, Kaseya, huge headline grabbing, um, you know, attacks that have happened this year. Um, and then also one to many attacks. We've seen this called buffalo jumping or island hopping before where you're not the end target of this cyber attack. It's whoever your organization is working with or providing services for or, you know, collects or um, retains sensitive information. So maybe you're a insurance company and you've got a lot of, you know, IP or sensitive details, uh, manufacturing, logistics, transportation, huge industries that we're seeing being hit right now. Um, Sid, I know you work a lot on like the um, the contractual side of things uh, with the supply chain or one to many attacks. How might that affect an organization's contractual obligations? Sure, that's a great question. And depending on who you are, whether you're on the service provider side or customer side, what we're seeing increasingly as sort of the industry standard is requirements for one cybersecurity controls in the contract itself. But along those lines, also having proper insurance coverages to, you know, cover the type of engagement you're doing. Um, and it's not just, you know, one particular agreement or one particular client. If you're on the service provider side, they want to see sufficient coverages for all of your clients or potentially across um, your clients or a sufficient amount in terms of insurance coverage where you can actually cover multiple clients if you are a service provider. And then consequently, if you are one of those uh, companies that are going to look out for a service provider um, to provide you with, you know, essential services, you might want to dictate insurance coverage terms in your agreement, right? And so that way, if there is an incident, sometimes looking to insurance can help, um, you know, assuage some of those costs associated with it or the, the issues of who's going to pay and so forth. So that's what we're seeing a lot of times these days with respect to agreements. 
Absolutely. So it's been a, kind of a perfect storm over the last year with this remote working environment and everybody, you know, their endpoints are everywhere nowadays. And especially, you know, we're in the United States, at least in the height of this holiday season and between Thanksgiving and Christmas and New Year, a lot of people have plans to travel now that they're able to a little bit more. So now our endpoints are really roaming just beyond the, the home network. Uh, and then this forced and quick digital transformation that a lot of organizations went through. And I think that the cyber insurance market is adjusting to that because just like for many organizations who are you know, struggling to keep up with cyber attacks and managing their networks, um, that it's really been that, that perfect storm over the last couple of years. Um, I think that the hardening of this industry and, you know, a lot of people come to us and say, uh, I've had cyber insurance for the last couple of years and I just got a notification from my underwriter that I'm no longer insurable, which has been really eye opening for a lot of people. Um, and so it, it's caused a lot of tension for many Defendify customers, but how is this a good thing? Well, I mean, it's, from the vantage point of the business that's being told they're no longer insurable, right? It's seldom perceived as a good thing. However, the underwriting process itself can be used as a diagnostic tool to get organizations to practice better cyber hygiene. So by saying we are only going to continue to offer you coverage if you come up with a solution for, you know, sunsetting end of life software that's no longer being supported by, by the developer. If you're told that you need to implement multi-factor authentication, you know, if you're told that you need to have endpoint detection and response or do uh, phishing training for your employees, right? These are measures that the insurers want to see you take so that you can present them yourself as a better risk. And it has the that side effect of making you less vulnerable to an attack, right? As a broker, right, we are not a cybersecurity vendor. So we're not the ones who are actually going in and deploying these controls on your system, but we can tell you what moves the needle for the underwriters. And our goal is to present you as the best risk to in the you know most favorable light possible to the underwriters. Any more than I would want you to go get fire insurance without having a sprinkler system or without running fire drills for your employees. We want you to have controls in place that make it less likely that you will suffer an event and in that way get you more favorable pricing and coverage uh, from the underwriters than you would otherwise be able to obtain. So it's kind of like when I when I go out and I drive my car, I've got my car insurance, but that doesn't give me, you know, the the right to be able to, you know, knock back three martinis, get in my car, drive down the highway the wrong way with no headlights on in the middle of the night at 100 miles an hour. Um, I take steps to be a good driver as best I possibly can. I mean, I do live in New England, so we don't always use our blinkers, and I do usually drive about the speed limit or somewhere around there. Um, so I try to take yeah. steps to reduce my risk, to be a good driver, to not just be out crazy on the road. But if something bad does happen, then I have my car insurance policy in order to be able to you know, not be without a vehicle and have a rental, get it fixed for you know less than my insurance premium would be and just like have my car back and be back on the road again right. safely. So. And, and actually, Sean, it's interesting that you mention auto specifically because Many of the cyber insurers now are offering incentives for their policyholders to engage certain cybersecurity firms to come in, either from a diagnostic standpoint or from a preventative standpoint. Um, and those specific services they will offer to help defray the cost. You know, they may call it a risk mitigation discount or credit. And I analogize this when I speak to clients to a defensive driving course, right? They're not going to underwrite the entire cost of it, right? But they so believe in that, that you utilize these services that they will actually give you a small credit or discount towards the cost of it. Uh, and, and that just shows you another difference between cyber insurance and other products which may pick up bits and pieces of the exposure, right? Is that when you're buying cyber coverage, you're also buying the expertise that comes with it, not only from the underwriters, but also from this 
what's come to be known as an ecosystem, if you will, of incident response vendors and pre-incident vendors like, like a Defendify that can come in and actually help an organization better manage cyber risk. Um, and so the idea is to you know, respond to the continuing changes in the threat environment and help organizations you know, mature in their cyber hygiene. Absolutely. It's like the, the old adage, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Uh, we, we see that a lot. And many Defendify customers have actually gone back to their cyber insurance providers and they got the, the questionnaire, you know, that when they originally kind of like a risk assessment when they first signed up for their policy. And if they've gone through and implemented additional security measures like, you know, security awareness training, endpoint detection, vulnerability management programs, new policies. They've developed an incident response plan. Um, they've actually many customers have been successful in being able to go back to their cyber insurance provider and saying, "Hey, I've taken steps to mitigate my risk. Is there anything that we can do about my my premium?" And Sid, I know that you work with a lot of organizations on the legal side of a breach. Um, what are some questions or considerations that uh, business leadership should be asking? before they they get to that breach point? Sure, that's a great question. And actually, I think it goes into a little bit of one of the questions presented in the Q&A about cyber insurance companies lobbying for um, scrutiny and executives. One thing I will say is there is an increasing push for better C-suite oversight into cybersecurity operations, right? This, is no, this has never been an IT-only problem. And I think that that message is coming to the forefront. So from that perspective, the organization at all levels should be aware of cybersecurity risk, right? So that's the first thing. And then from a from a assessment standpoint, think about you know the types of data you have, um, the nature of your information security program, um, the costs associated with what would happen. Let's say if you have a ransomware incident, right? Well, how good are your backup and recovery procedures? It's not sort of a it's not sort of a, 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 a simple math equation, if you will, where you plug in these numbers and you get an ideal cyber insurance coverage dollar amount at the end of it, right? That's really not how it goes, not always. But there are things you can do to help you make an informed or, or, a, or a very well-informed decision on what your coverages should look like. So prior to a breach, um, look at where you hold data, all right? What type of environment controls you have? Uh, do you, for example, use a data center in a in a hall broom closet? Um, do you have a data center maybe on uh, on Amazon Cloud or something like that? Uh, what are the costs associated with recreating a data? What are the strengths of your security program? Right? It's never about a perfect security program. There's no such thing. It's about making sure you're still doing the right things and continuously improving your security program. I know a lot of times I've talked to clients when they're in the in the procurement stage and say, well. I don't really have a good security program. I'm afraid of even going and asking the questions about what I need for insurance coverage. And I always counsel them was, there is no such thing as perfect insurance. Uh, sorry, there's no such thing as perfect information security. It's a matter of you know judging where you are right now, assessing your risks and trying to continually improve yourself. So never be afraid of, of going out there and looking into what those things are. Um, the other thing too I'll say is bad facts are okay, right? Every organization seems to think that, oh my God, I don't have MFA on this particular environment. You know, am I going to be uh, um, am I going to be prohibited from getting coverage, right? Bad facts are okay. They're sort of a fact of life, especially in information security, right? You want to be able to I want to identify those and then take steps to actually address or mitigate or remediate in some fashion. Where you really get into trouble is if you turn a blind eye to things. Right, that's really what you don't want to. So don't be afraid of bad facts. That's that's the other takeaway I'll have for you guys. Absolutely. Um, and on the actual response side of things, um, what are some exclusions to look for when you're going through your cybersecurity policy? I mean, there there's a multitude of exclusions that may apply. I've seen everything from uh, bodily injury and property damage to war to even you know vermin including but not limited to squirrels um, there, there's, there's there's literally on, on, on a given cyber policy there may actually be a few dozen different exclusions the key thing to realize here right is what is it that we are trying to protect 
We're trying to protect your network and we're try trying to protect your data assets, right? So, you know, there are, you know, and, 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 and a 60 minute webinar does not permit us to go into this level of detail, but there are, you know, coverage checklists and things that you can look at and, and a broker can help you do this, right? To kind of say, all right, this is the off the shelf warning. And here is what we've been able to negotiate for some clients with some carriers, particularly if they're larger accounts and they are taking a heftier retention, retaining more of the risk, right? So, you know, for some, uh, you know, a, a, um, a mom and pop, right, that might have a 10 or a $25,000 policy deductible, they may not necessarily be able to get some of those exclusions removed, right? For a large regional bank that has a, you know, 500,000 or a million dollar retention, they might be able to, right? And so it's going to vary based on the type of business, um, how large the organization is, and, and frankly, also the capabilities of the broker who's negotiating the coverage to know, um, you know, what, what areas to be able to push back on uh, with a given underwriter. And you find out what's really important to a business, right? Like, for example, one of the things that is very difficult but not impossible to get coverage for now is the wrongful collection of data. Now, many of the new privacy regulations that have come out uh, in Europe, and we're beginning to see them in California and some other states here, and I'm sure you know, Sid can speak to the, the, the onslaught of privacy regs that we're dealing with, uh, actually can hold an, a business liable for not having systems in place to make sure that they don't collect data for which they're not authorized to do so. Um, they need to have a privacy policy that states how the data will be handled, and they need to comply with whatever laws are in place in the jurisdictions in which they operate. Well, again, if the regulations are saying that this is something for which an organization could be uh, fined and could have to respond to a regulatory inquiry, then I would want to get a carve back from that exclusion to say, we're not gonna cover every wrongful collection claim under the face of the earth, but if it arises in the context of a regulatory proceeding, this exclusion does not apply. And that's just one example of a multitude where you may be able to go back and negotiate um, some carve back wording on the policy. But again, it takes a broker who knows how to navigate these policies and what to ask for and to be able to have the relationships with the underwriters to be able to get those results for their clients. Kind of makes me think of, a, there was one time I had a, a medical procedure done and I thought it was going to be covered by my insurance. And then I ended up left holding the bag for the, the entire amount on it. So you never want to wait until after something has happened to find out that it is not covered by your insurance policy or you've made you know some small mistake. Like you know if I didn't get a, a pre-approval from my doctor before I had this procedure or I was traveling and went to a doctor that was out of my network and it wasn't covered. Um, one of the questions here, and I'll, I'll pose this over to you, Sid, uh, was asking about uh, will cyber insurers agree in the policy to permit the insured to use an IT forensics consultant and legal counsel of the insured's choice to respond to an incident. So uh, this is one of the things I think you should definitely find out before you're in the middle of that crisis so that you're prepared with the answer and know exactly what to do and can incorporate that into your incident response plan. So uh, can you use a forensic team or a response team of your choice? The answer is yes, if you make sure you bargain for it when you enter into that insurance uh, agreement. Um, so I'll give you an example, right? So a lot of times insurance companies or insurers will have panel attorneys and panel forensics companies um, amongst many reasons. One is rates, right? They get preferred rates on the work that those attorneys or those forensics companies do, or they might be, you know, um, uh, firms or forensics companies that are very good at the specific area that they do. So if you have a ransomware incident, you want someone who's well worse with ransomware. If you have a business email compromise, you want someone who's good at business email compromise. So that's one benefit. And in some cases, you might have a preferred insurance company, a preferred law firm or a, an IT consultant. Let's say you have a current engagement with an MSSP, right? You might have, you might use Defendify's platform, for example, in your environment, and you'd love to be able to have Defendify also help you in, the, in, in case of an incident, right? Great, absolutely. It makes sense. They know your environment, they know your organization, they know your people, they know your controls makes that job that much more easier when you're in the middle of a firefight in an incident response. Same thing applies to law firms as well. 
you might have counsel that knows your organization really well, knows the types of data, knows the regulatory environment that you're you're you're, um, you're under, and so they might have a better job being able to counsel you. And what happens is you want to make sure that you have those people either via an endorsement, and David can probably speak to this better, is making sure you have an endorsement on your insurance policy that says, well, in the case of these incidents, I would like to be able to use my choice of a friend's company or my choice of a law firm. What usually happens is that insurance companies will say that's okay as long as that insurance, that law firm or that forensics company agrees to insurance rates as well. And most of the time that that usually is, is, is sort of the, the big um, friction area. And in my case, I've never actually had an issue turned away or, or had an insurer, for example, turn Ice Miller away on rates alone. We usually want to work with the insurance company, at least for the benefit of our clients to be able to say, hey, you know what? We want to step in and do things. So all that to say is the answer is yes. You just have to make sure that you have the appropriate language in your insurance policy. Yeah, I, I'm following on what Sid said. I, I, I agree with all of that. And I would just point out that the timing is important. The time to have that discussion is prior to the binding of coverage. But the broker should be raising these concerns with the underwriter and saying to them, here are the law firm, the public relations consultant, the forensics investigators that this insured would like to use. Here are the timekeepers' names. Here's access to their CV on their firm website. Here are their rates. And get those firms, get those providers vetted prior to the binding of coverage. The time not to have that discussion is once there's a claim, right? Because at that point, we're dealing with an adjuster, the clock is ticking, they need to start working on the incident response, and they don't have time at that juncture to begin to vet those firms. So you, you, you wanna be able, if you, if you have preferred vendors that you would like to use, legal counsel or otherwise, you wanna bring that to the attention of your broker and let them have a conversation with the underwriter and have that included by endorsement on the policy rather than to wait until there's a claim and then present your preferred service provider at that time. Absolutely. And it's very beneficial to be able to have, you know, a, a, if you don't have preferred counsel of choice, we can make a recommendation, but to have the network of the insurance provider, if you do not have that, you know, Rolodex, so to speak, of cybersecurity incident responders. Mm -hmm. um, so in, in the case of having an incident, so is this one of those scenarios where, you know, if I have a, a car accident, my insurance premium, unless you've got, you know, all that accident forgiveness stuff, uh, is that, it, what kind of impact could that have on uh, your cyber insurance renewal? Right. Well, the reality is that if you have an open claim, when I say claim, that may be a first party event or a third party claim from a plaintiff or a regulator. If you have an open matter and you're heading into renewal, the claims and the underwriting folks at the carrier are going to be talking to each other and they may have questions about it. In and of itself, the fact that you have a claim that is still pending should not be a bar to coverage. And in fact, that's an argument for you not moving from one carrier to another, right? In a perfect world, um, your insurer would pay the claim regardless of whether they were still the one on the risk. Obviously, many of these things are a matter of gray areas of policy interpretation. They are open to negotiation. And obviously, human nature being what it is, an insurer is more inclined to take what we call a commercial approach and be more accommodating. Oh, you wanna use an off-panel service provider? Sure, we'll have a conversation about that. Or, you know, this doesn't really fall under the policy, under Betterment, but we'll allow it here because we understand you're trying to make sure this doesn't happen again. Those conversations are a lot easier to have when the insurer that's paying the claim is still collecting premium, okay? so. All that being said, the best course of action is to contact your broker and you know, our, our, our default, if you will, we would do it without your consent, but our default is to notify the insurer of any matter that could result in a loss under the policy. 
Even if you just discovered some suspicious activity on the network, you're not sure any data has yet been compromised. Um, it, the, the time to have those discussions, again, is you don't wanna go into renewal and not have these matters reported because the date that somebody in a position of authority within your organization becomes aware, the date that they discover that there's been an event is what controls when you have an obligation to notify your carrier, okay? So if you wait to report that matter until after the policy renews, you may find yourself not being able to obtain coverage. And even if you do obtain coverage, if you've begun spending money out of your own pocket to respond to that incident and you did not get the carrier's consent prior to tendering notice to the carrier, those costs could be excluded. So for a number of reasons, right, the, the um, balance on the scales always points in the direction of full transparency and notifying your insurer of what you're dealing with, both to protect your organization so that you can collect on the claim and also because it's the ethical thing to do. We've talked to a lot of organizations who call us, they have a security incident, they're you know, right in the middle of the fire. And that's one of the very first questions that we always ask them is, do you have a cybersecurity insurance provider? Because um, that's, that's going to change a, a lot of different things. And I've seen some horror stories of organizations who have tried to do you know, some preliminary forensics first. And it kind of reminds me, I, I grew up with a dad who was a firefighter for 25 years and being the curious little kid that I was we you know we were going to go mini golfing and then you know all of a sudden it was oh no we've got to go to this structure fire instead and I had to sit in a car and entertain myself for a couple hours while they fought the fire but when my dad got back I would always say like oh how did it start what happened and my dad used to tell me all the time almost every single time I asked him he would say my job is just to put out the fire he's like I don't do any of the forensics and and it's not my job to figure out how it started. So, you know, we, we don't want to see people getting into that, that, their own forensic investigation, just you have that insurance policy for a reason, call them, bring them in, you know, it can be very hard to tell where something started, when something started, and you want to make sure that you are, um, you know, keeping all of the, the evidence intact, we'll, we'll say. Um, another question that I had, um, I'll throw this over to you, Sid, how can a uh, security breach impact like the potential for you know, mergers and acquisitions? Because we, we've seen a lot of that going on. What kind of impact can a breach have? Sure. Um, you know, increasingly, we are seeing more and more data security and privacy diligence in M&A deals, right? So when you look at traditional M&A deals, you know, even as recently as just a handful of years ago, they focus on your company's financials, you know, whether or not if they buy you or if you were going to acquire somebody, whether you will be profitable. But more and more, we're seeing a very strong and heavy focus and scrutiny on the DSP aspect, the data security and privacy side of it. And as part of that, you know, what you're, what you are, uh, what do you have in terms of insurance coverages as well? Your traditional M&A deals when it comes to these DSP questions includes, you know, what types of data have you had? Have you suffered a breach in the last in the last five years? Are there any regulatory oversight actions that are coming that you are a subject of? Um, so more and more focus on that, and obviously that's going to impact how the M and A deal goes, right? If you are, for example, a subject of a data breach, or you have some sort of regulatory oversight, maybe from a state's attorney general, or maybe the Office of Civil Rights, if if you're subject to HIPAA those things are going to impact your, your M&A deal. And so it's all the more important to make sure you have your ducks in a row, even from that perspective. If you are a startup company, for example, and you want to make yourself a viable candidate as a target for an acquisition, it's all the more reason for you to have a good information security posture, good cyber insurance coverage, and good overall you know, uh, information security practices, if you will. Absolutely. Um, we, we've talked to a few companies that I, the one that always comes to mind for me with the, the M&A impact is the Marriott Starwood breach. You know, they, they inherited that big old mess and even I'm sure they did quite a bit of due diligence in that process, but still you never know what, what can be, uh, 
and lurking in the network. Here's a pretty interesting question that we'll jump into here. This can be a, a little polarizing. So there have been some recommendations and a lot of conversation about uh, ban a potential ban or proposed ban on making ransomware payments. Uh, this is not anything that's you know like in effect right now, but um, how could that affect the cybersecurity insurance side of things? Um, let me uh, let me take a stab at that one. So you know, for starters, I think everybody needs to understand, right? that there already are some collars, some guardrails around the payment of ransom. Um, the US Department of Treasury, the Office of Foreign Assets Control within the Treasury Department has a list of sanctioned territories as well as sanctioned entities and individuals, right? These are called specially designated nationals to whom you cannot transact business. And so as a result of that, you can't make a ransom payment. One of the jobs of a threat consultant, which is a service provider who is hired by the insured at the recommendation of their insurer, is to come in and do an assessment of whether the threat actors here are associated with any of those sanctioned entities. And they do this through reverse engineering of the threat actors' IP addresses, things about their modus operandi. I mean, stuff that's frankly, I'm not a security guy and it's above my pay grade, but they're able to determine with reasonable certainty whether there's any indication that these folks are on the naughty list. And if they are, then as a national security matter, and a business cannot make payment and the insurer is not going to make payment and the threat consultant is not gonna facilitate the payment, okay? There can exceptions be made to this? Yes, you have to go to treasury, essentially get a license to make the payment. That is very, very rare. But the fact of the matter is, while I don't condone garden variety criminals perpetrating these attacks on organizations, that's a separate issue from anybody that would be a state-sponsored terrorist or any other uh, entity that's considered a national security risk. So please understand that there already are some legal guidelines around this. Now, the question is whether we should ban ransomware payments outright. I'm speaking for myself now, not necessarily on behalf of my employer, but I don't think this is, would bring about the desired result. I think what people need to understand is that the insurance marketplace responded to the advent of ransomware, right? It didn't create this crisis. And so the threat consultant will come in and assess what can be done to terminate the threat without making the payment of the ransom. Like for example, is there a decryption key available? Are there data backups such that, you know, the organization can get by without recovering that data? If they can terminate the threat without paying the ransom, they will do so. And then they will try to negotiate it as low as possible. But the fact of the matter is, if we take away that option from businesses, the results could have some unintended consequences. First of all, the insurers could wind up paying for extended periods of business interruption or data restoration costs. So they're not going to be getting off scot-free. And frankly, for some businesses, they may never recover from the event. Either because of the financial loss or their reputational harm, they may simply file for bankruptcy and people's livelihoods could be at stake. So there's a lot of factors to consider here. Again, payment of the ransom should always be considered a last resort. It should never be done when there's a national security implication to the payment. But as it stands right now, once those steps are taken, once that due diligence is exercised, a business is left to their discretion as to whether or not to negotiate with the bad actors. And I trust businesses to make the right decision for themselves and their stakeholders. As we said the other day, attackers gonna attack, whether we're, we're making the ransomware payments hate. or not. Exactly. Um, I always think that's a, a very interesting conversation. Um, really quickly here, I'm going to launch a poll question. Just uh, curious from our, our audience and our attendees. Uh, if you currently have a cybersecurity insurance policy, so you can throw some votes in there. Um, Dominic has a question here. Should insurers be doing more for cyber prevention? I mean, again, I, I believe they've begun to do so in two ways. One is by simply making the underwriting requirements more stringent, 
which while that may be inconvenient to brokers like myself and to our clients, right, is sort of like eating your vegetables. It's a, it's a necessary, you know, step in this process of the cyber insurance product maturing and becoming sustainable. The other thing that they're doing is they're helping to connect their insureds with service providers who can help them diagnose and take steps to prevent any kind of vulnerabilities. Um, you know, there are a number of initiatives out there on the carrier side and also on the part of brokers to introduce businesses to vendors who have been vetted by the underwriters and who the underwriters believe add value in the process. As I said, sometimes they incentivize this with a credit or a discount towards those services. Um, so there is you know, room for improvement. And I think brokers, frankly, could do a better job at publicizing those risk mitigation services to their clients. Um, but there are initiatives on the part of the underwriting community to bring those service providers to the organizations who could benefit from them and thereby eliminate some of these uh, vulnerabilities that they currently have. So we'll, we'll share our poll results here. So our uh, poll question, do you ha currently have a cybersecurity insurance policy? We had 92% of people who voted said yes. Uh, nobody said no, so awesome. And then uh, we had 8% uh, say, I'm not sure. So might wanna find uh, the answer out to that one. And I'm gonna flip a question over to Sid that came in through the Q&A while I launch our last poll question here. Um, so has your cyber insurance premium increased this year? So at your most recent renewal or, uh, so we've got no, we've got yes, and then we've got a couple different ranges, you know, by a, a little bit, by a, a good amount, or, you know, by a uh, hundred percent or more. So if your premium doubled. So um, just kind of getting a, a feel for how many increases we've been seeing, because this is definitely a um, question that we, we hear a lot. So the question that came through in the Q&A, Sid, says, as a computer consultant, can we charge the insurance company with our claims or have to go through the client? It depends on the policy. <laughs> Sorry for the lawyer answer, but it really does depend. In some cases, depending on how the policy is structured, um, the client, for example, might pay a certain amount up to a deductible amount after which the insurance policy will kick in and the insurers will, will cover it. And in other times, sometimes the insurer will pay up to a certain amount uh, as part of the deductible and so forth. So it really just depends on the policy. And you want to either ask the client what you should do in that situation or whoever is actually the one that's in fact engaging you. Uh, in some cases, for example, you might get engaged as a consultant, you might get engaged by a law firm for the purposes of attorney client privilege or to protect that investigation under privilege. And so in those situations, you want to have that conversation with the entity or the party that's actually retaining you for your consultant services. Awesome. Um, so I'll, I'll throw this uh, last part out and we're, we're down to the last 10 minutes. So if you have any uh, questions that our panelists have not answered or something that you would like them to expand upon, you can go ahead and toss that down into the Q&A or the chat. We'll end this last poll and share some results. So 30% the lucky group have not had a cybersecurity insurance premium increase this year. 35% uh, say yes by like about a quarter of the premium, 25%, uh, yes, 25 to 50% increase, and then 10% by 100% or more. So uh, definitely seeing a, a lot of increases in those premiums. So thank you all for, for voting. We had a feeling that we were seeing this out there. Um, and then I'll flip this over to you guys for our last topic while we wait and see if there are any other questions, because I know it takes a minute to type them into the, the Q&A section. Sure. Um, but what, what are some of the cybersecurity insurance myths that you would like to debunk today? Yeah, I mean, for myself, the biggest one is that cyber insurance does not pay claims. And I think that the reason that that um, narrative has not uh, gone away entirely is because sometimes there are headlines in, you know, whether it's in mainstream media or trade publications or something that says something to the effect of, 
court rules in favor of insurer in cyber coverage dispute. And that's as far as some people actually read. But if you go beyond the headline, you'll see that the policy that they're talking about in those articles is typically not a cyber insurance policy. It was, say, their property, their crime, their general liability. And we talked in the beginning about the difference between a cyber policy that's truly designed to pick up these types of losses versus other insurance products that really weren't created with the digital world in mind. And they typically have some type of exclusions on them that prevent the insured from you know, obtaining a recovery. Uh, this is something that Insurance Geek calls silent cyber coverage, where you are looking for hidden cyber coverage in these other policies. And the problem is that when an, a business doesn't buy cyber insurance or doesn't buy enough or the right kind of it, they could find themselves trying to fit a square peg into a round hole, where they're trying to trigger coverage under another policy that really wasn't meant to cover that type of loss. So because courts will invariably rule against the policyholder, under those circumstances, right, that the headlines could leave the, the reader with the impression that the insurance company got off scot-free, that they really should have paid a claim and the court somehow wound up ruling in their favor. When in fact, that set of facts is screaming for a standalone, you know, made for this scenario solution to, you know, the, the problem of, of the insured suffering a loss, right? I mean, that's an argument for cyber insurance coverage, not against it. But if you don't read past the headline, you could be left with the impression that the, the policy was written for cyber and that it didn't perform. Absolutely. Um, Sid, do you have a myth you'd like to debunk No, I, today? I think it somewhat piggybacks of uh, what David said. Uh, one of the big things that I always see is I just like to have some policy in place and that's better than no policy at all. And I actually think that can be potentially even worse than having no policy at all because you sort of end up in a situation where you have a false sense of coverage, if you will. Um, <laughs> they have a, I work with a partner. He always likes to, likes to say, um, people buy cyber insurance the way people who don't understand wine buy wine at a restaurant. I felt very called out by this because I don't really know wine all that much. And what he said was, they don't go buying the most expensive thing because it's really expensive and they don't want to look cheap and they don't, so they don't buy the cheapest. So they just go with the middle of the road option. And you don't want to do that with cyber insurance coverage, right? You don't want to just buy one for the sake of buying one. You want to make sure that you actually account for your risks when it comes to data, for example, your infrastructure, your organization. And you also want to make sure that it fits your organization. That's the important thing, right? Because the last thing you want to do is, like David said, was go file coverage or file a claim and you find out you don't have coverage for that type of incident or, or, or the, the facts of that matter. So that, that's the other myth. The takeaway is don't just think that having any cyber insurance policy is better than having nothing. Make sure you take steps to actually understand what you have coverage for and don't have coverage for. And the best time to have that conversation is before you find yourself having a cybersecurity incident. Yesterday. It's, yes. Yeah, to have the yes. conversation yesterday. Yeah, the best time to plant a tree was 30 years ago. The next best time is today. <laughs> Awesome. Well, we'll see uh, if there are any questions coming in. I don't see any right now. Uh, hopefully everybody is still awake here uh, and see if uh, there are any other audience questions. Uh, and then I have uh, your contact information as well. So if um, somebody wants to learn more, uh, take a, a deeper look into their cybersecurity coverage, uh, their insurance. If you have any questions from, you know, the legal side of things, I've got uh, both of your contact information down there. Uh, we also put together here at Defendify a free cyber insurance readiness checklist. So it's got a few questions uh, that you can ask yourself to find out if you have some of the 
basics in place. Um, so, you know, if you're performing regular risk assessments, if you perform cybersecurity awareness training, um, just some questions to ask whether you are a member of senior leadership and you're just not quite sure, you know, you have to talk to the you know, IT professional. If you are the IT professional and, you know, you're trying to get some different changes in your coverage, um, you know, you can present this either way to your, your non-technical senior leadership or if you're non-technical senior leadership, you can send it over to your IT staff. Uh, or if you are a technology service provider, it's a great conversation starter for your clients um, because they you definitely should be, it, you know, if you have the flexibility and the ability to do this in your business, require your clients to have some type of cybersecurity insurance coverage just to really make sure that, you know, they're not going to ever get into a situation where, you know, your clients suffer a breach, you know, there are financial losses, there's downtime, they're going to look for someone to blame, somewhere to point the finger, and some way to recoup those losses. Um, if you think about how much your clients freak out if their, you know, network is down for an hour and they can't, you know, get on the interwebs, just imagine what it would be like if it was two weeks or, you know, and then they, they suffer a huge loss. There's going to be a blame game and I, I don't want to see anybody in that situation. So great cyber insurance readiness checklist for you to share in internally. Um, and then we have a, another question in here. Do you service MA? I'm guessing that's Massachusetts. If I'm wrong, you can go ahead and type that in either the, the chat or the Q&A on that question. Uh, but yes, Defendify does service Massachusetts. Uh, gentlemen, do you work in Massachusetts as well? Well, Alliant transacts business in all 50 states. I'm a licensed property and casualty broker in New York, um, but that's just me personally, um, Alliant operates nationwide. And I'm not barred in Massachusetts, but do handle stuff in Massachusetts, absolutely. Right. Well, you mean like the legal bar, not like you're not barred from Massachusetts. That's you know? correct, that's yeah. correct, I, I should have clarified. <laughs> <laughs> Probably a crazy college story in there. Yeah, De Defendify does do um, the, we service all of the United States, a uh, huge presence up in Canada. We are international. I think we're in over 20 different countries. So we definitely can um, can help you out. We'll look for a couple more um, questions and give a few more seconds. And then I will also throw the link for that checklist down in the chat for everybody. And thank you, gentlemen, for uh, joining me. Thank you for all of our attendees for taking a little bit of time out of your day and joining our discussion. Thanks and for having us. Throw thank this you. link down here in the chat for you if you would like to get a copy of that cyber insurance readiness checklist. Any other questions that you may have as all of this information we just threw at you over the last hour starts to settle in, uh, you can feel free to reach out to Defendify, email either of our panelists to learn more about how they can help you so that you never get into that situation that I know personally all too well where you know, you're on that right side of boom and everything is just absolutely crazy because the last time you want to, you know, have to try to figure out what your incident response plan is, is in the middle of an active incident. So make sure that you have those conversations before something happens, because in this day and age, we have to operate under the assumption that something can and will happen. It's all about mitigating the damage and, you know, reducing the, the financial and downtime effects of that type of incident. So thank you, everybody, for joining us. Until next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.